I love my my work and I love my well my, my boss and my 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 coworkers. My sister is um, focusing my goal, focusing my work, and I help my my parents get over soon. Okay, hi, I'm Casey. Uh, I live here in Kansas City. My family and I live in Shawnee, and my husband and I have been married for 17 years this October. We have two kids. Our daughter, who's 13, had a brain injury at birth, and so she's medically complex. She's really the reason why I started doing this 10 years ago. And then we have our son, Dominic, who is 11, and he was diagnosed with high-functioning autism and ADHD. So we've got the whole gamut of therapies and two IEP meetings every you know, semester and all the things. It's really fun. So today I'm going to talk to you guys about what, it's, what you need to do in order to create a short, mid, and long-term future for your kiddo. And I'm going to call them kiddos if that's okay. Mm -hmm. I call all of them kiddos even when they're 45. Okay, because we're, we're all parents, yeah, right? Okay, good, I hope that's okay. So I think it's really important to talk a little bit about um, how many of us there are in the country. There were some, uh, some statistics that were done or a survey that was done with families all over the country and a variety of diagnoses, and it was actually pretty eye-opening in my opinion. 82% um, of families are concerned about financial resources for their child with a disability. Is that any of you? Raise your hands, maybe. It was me, I know. 77% of people are concerned they won't be able to retire, and those who are uh, will have to somehow compromise their own retirement just in order to provide for their adult with a disability, okay? 60% of families who have life insurance or parents who have life insurance have less than $300,000 of coverage and yet caring for an individual, for example, with autism is between 1.4 and 2.4 million dollars, and yes, that is out of pocket. That is after benefits, that's after everything, okay? 73% of parents do not have a long-term care plan. Like when you get old, what happens? Who's paying for that? Who's doing it? 87% of families are concerned about what will happen to their adult child when they're no longer able to do the care anymore. Anybody here? Fear that? If you don't, please come coach me on why you don't fear that. <laughs> because um, I, this was my biggest thing, and the reason why I started my practice 10 years ago was to try and ease this fear. Um, and I think a lot of people, may, maybe I'm wrong, but you know, open for discussion. What, what do you do? How do you replace yourself? What's your replacement? Who is the replacement team? Who's plan B? And that's a big question, and it's not one that we typically will solve in a couple of weeks, right? That takes some time. 59% of families have not written a will. Anybody here have an estate plan done? Good, very good, okay. You'll hear a lot about that today from a variety of presenters. 67% of parents have set up a special needs trust address addressing the needs of their, their adult child with a disability. How many have a special needs trust? Good job. How many have had one since before 2020? Has it been reviewed since then? Needs to be. A lot of changes have happened. 23% of families that have a formal financial plan for their dependent, only about 37% are working with a financial planner. And I think part of this lower statistic is because there aren't enough of what I do professionally in the world, and there needs to be more. A big piece of my practice is educating other advisors across the country. I have a study group that I lead of about 65, 70 advisors, and we meet every quarter just doing continuing education. Because there's a lot of changes that happen in our world, legally, financially, benefits-wise, that families have to know about. And so it is, uh, it is a need. This is my family. This is taken last July. Our daughter is Hudson. She's there in the front left. Can you see her? I like bragging about her. She had a surgery yesterday. She had a VNS battery replacement. And I was a little nervous, even though it's like one of those routine surgeries, you always just get a little like, ugh. It was 40 minutes, we were home by noon. And she woke up this morning smiling, and I'm like, you're a total rock star. I don't know how you do that. But she's amazing. So um, she's 13. <laughs> Anyone have a teenager? 
Okay, y'all need to come give me advice because I was not expecting the sassiness that is now happening. Um, even though she's nonverbal, uh, she has a communication device. She has an eye gaze device. So she looks at this like big iPad and when she focuses on a button it will verbalize for her what she wants. And so her favorite thing to say to me is no and goodbye. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much. Yeah, love you too. You know. Her dad comes in the room. I love you. <laughs> you know, nobody told me that all the delays that she's had because of her brain injury were, you know, going to happen later or very, very slow. And so we're working through therapies. We're doing all these things. Nobody told me the sassiness would show up right on time. Yeah. Like, what is that? Anyway, I love her. She's amazing. She, so she's got a long list of diagnoses because of the brain injury. We see like nine specialists at Children's Mercy. Um, she is just really coming into her own, loves to be read to, and she's learning how to read now with her eye gaze device, which is pretty cool. Her favorite color is purple. Anybody K-State fans in here? Okay. I, my parents live over in Manhattan, near Manhattan, so I think that's why, plus they're purple and white, right? However, um, just recently we were accepted into Team Impact. Have you guys heard of this organization? Okay, write this down. It's totally free to families. It's an, a, a 501c nonprofit that's based in Boston, and they partner with NCAA college sports teams all across the country. And for two, it's a two-year commitment to families, but the individual with a disability gets to basically be part of that team once they're matched. So Hudson got matched with the KU softball team. So I'm like, oh crap, we're gonna have to get blue and red now. <laughs> and so that's what she got for Christmas, was a lot of KU stuff, so rock chalk. Um, but if you haven't heard, the, it, by the way, the intake process is super easy. It's like a two-page application. You're on the phone for an hour. They have a case manager that works with you. It's very, very professional. Um, and we've had an amazing experience. So I'm like bragging about it a lot. I got referred to them through a contact I have at Children's Mercy. So it's, it's been really cool. Um, we also have a son. His name's Dominic. He's 11. And like I said, he has autism and ADHD. He's very into Roblox. Have you guys heard of this? Computer. I mean, all the boys want to be on the computer or the iPad. We have to limit time sometimes. But he and his dad are very into Formula One racing. His team is Red Bull, loves Max Verstappen, for those of you who are fans. And, you know, I'm a very proud mom because he loves computer programming and math, so he tells me all the time, Mom, I'm going to do what you do when you're done. Okay, good. Like that. <laughs> Professionally, I've been in financial services for... 16 or 17 years now. I've had my practice for 10. Uh, we have an office over in Leewood. I also meet, will meet families downtown. However, during COVID, my practice really grew and we did a lot as we all did over Zoom. And so I started working more nationally. Uh, currently we work with between four and 500 families in like 30 states. So oftentimes families will ask me unique questions. What happens when I retire and I don't wanna live in Kansas anymore? Can I move somewhere else? And I'm like, yes, you can. You can, it takes some planning, but you can. And guess what? There are a lot of other states that do better than here on things like Medicaid waivers where we have a 10-year wait list here, right? So that may be something we explore, but this is my team. My sister, Ashley, is there on the right of me. Um, she, left of me, sorry. Uh, she, she's my only sibling, so she's also our backup caregiver for our two kids. And so we're very close. We've been close for a long time. Uh, she's my right hand. She's our operations manager. And then I have Jason and Anthony who help us do a lot of our different uh, financial plans, uh, investment planning, et cetera. And Anthony's sister has a disability and Jason has been a lifelong volunteer here in Kansas City with a variety of organizations that serve people with disabilities. So we're very passionate about what we do. Um, anybody ever heard of the Kansas Council on Developmental Disabilities? Okay, you're gonna be hearing from Sarah a little bit later today. She's a very good friend of mine. So I sit on the council. I do a lot of work uh, at the state level for advocacy to improve the systems and the supports that we all are using. One of those being the IDD waiver, which has been a lot of conversation around that. I also hold the Chartered Special Needs Consultant designation. Anytime you're interviewing, by the way, financial professionals that do special needs planning, you, they should have that designation. It's a very specific designation that requires uh, training in how to do adult transition, education, and financial planning. What's it called again? The Chartered Special Needs Consultant. By the way, I can, I'm more than happy to send 
these slides if you guys want them. R fill out your email though, because and I'll have a QR code at the end if you'd rather just, you know, take a picture of it and fill out a form. Uh, I'm also a member of the Academy of Special Needs Planners, which is a large organization that is independent, but it is filled with attorneys, financial planners, trustees, um, other people who serve those with disabilities all, all along the spectrum, birth to, to passing and their families. Okay, our mission is to first and foremost educate you, provide you with information. I think it's very hard. Anybody feel like the information around this stuff is like scattered, siloed? You know, some of it's in the medical system, some of it's in the education system. Sometimes you have no idea where to ask or who to ask. The benefits, I mean, DSI is a huge resource, but my biggest frustration as a parent in the beginning was who do I talk to and where do I go and how do I do this? Is that anybody else here? Yeah. So we also want to facilitate these different conversations around who's your replacement team. And that can be an emotional conversation. You know, who, there's nobody that can do what you do better than you. I know that. There's nobody that can take care of my kids better than, than my husband and I. But there will be a time when that has to happen if they outlive us, okay? So how do we start thinking about who's the next best team? And what does that look like? I think worst case scenario is that you do nothing and now the system or somebody in your family is going to have that stress. Not to mention your child or your adult with a disability is going to go through pretty extreme trauma if there hasn't been a plan. They don't want to do that. Okay? So getting this done is really, really important. We also talk a lot to families, like I said, in a variety of different spectrums and it requires a lot of grace, integrity, and compassion. Those are big values of ours. Hudson's on the top left there. <laughs> She's very smiley most of the time. Uh, oh, um, I wrote a book. I have a few copies if you'd like to read it. This is not a financial planning book. It's really about Hudson's story, how we became parents to a kiddo with a brain injury. Um, we did, I did go through a traumatic delivery with her, uh, and so this is really just talking about how we got through that. The grief processing, the resources that we used, um, the team that, and the family that supported us. So if you want a good read, it's a quick read, a couple hours probably, 160 pages. It's on Amazon, 20 bucks. Kindle Unlimited, it's free. Okay, I wanna know, when it comes to your own finances, so we're gonna talk about money. Is that okay? <laughs> what do you worry about the most? Why did you wanna come to this presentation today? What's keeping you up at night? Anybody wanna share? Will there be enough at the end? Will there be enough, okay. What else? How to get best for your kiddo. How to get? Best for your What's the best for my kiddo? What's the highest quality of life? Yep. What else? How do you divide it up um, between the typical kids? And the totally. Estate equalization. Yeah, absolutely. How do we not disinherit somebody or not leave something to the other kids? Absolutely. I'm in the same boat. I have two. Okay. So what we hear every week, we don't know where to start. This is really overwhelming. Yeah. Some days I get up and I'm like, yep, going back to bed. <laughs> Zero degrees outside, mm -mm, not doing it. <laughs> I get it. But we have to do this, these things one step at a time. So the overwhelm is very normal. Casey, we have a lot in place already. Um, and I'll, my follow-up question to that is usually, that's awesome. I'm glad you have a special needs trust. Is it funded and how is it funded? Most of the time attorneys are not gonna teach you how to do this because they are not licensed financial planners. Okay, so how do we make sure that that trust is funded with enough, but also tax efficiently? Those are two very important things, because if you don't want it to run out of money, you have to address those two things, right? Kind of like your own retirement planning. We reverse engineer that. We have it all taken care of. I love this response. It means you've done something. But again, like I mentioned before, a lot of changes happen in this space. So it would be important if we had changes, right, to re-review it. Hey, let's just go back and double check. Let's make sure that you do have everything in place. Uh, wealthy families don't need this planning. I hear this a lot actually from case managers and social workers, believing I think that you can just private pay everything. I, I see a giggle. <laughs> I had somebody say, well, I don't need a Medicaid waiver. We're, we're just gonna you know, do things like we've always done. And I said, well, <clears throat> once you leave school, what, what is the plan, what's the schedule? for the day. 
They're like, oh, well, I don't know yet. And I said, well, you know, if you don't have the waiver or a plan, they're sitting at home. There's not, there's not a community resource that you can private pay for this world for that. Oh, well, I didn't know that. Right. So I think having a, a high net worth or even a, a, a decent amount of money to retire is a really great thing, but sometimes it requires more planning than, than a family who doesn't have a lot of means. Okay. So I want you guys to keep in mind a few things when we go through today's information. It's never too soon to start planning. Definitely can be too late. <laughs> I've experienced the too late version, and that's not fun. You do not have to do everything all at one time. Planning is a process. We do this step by step. And I also believe there's a lot of people, a lot of people here included, that are here to support you. And you have a team behind you if you choose it. Okay? But that's up to you to design. So today we're going to talk about essentially four things. Number one, who needs to be on your team to start answering these different questions and building this plan? What is a special needs plan? How does it work? What does it look like? And then we're going to talk about probably the two big topics, which are special needs trust and ABLE accounts. You guys have heard of the last two? Good. You're going to hear a lot more about those today. So why do we need to do life planning for people with disabilities? Well, we all know, or maybe we don't, but I'm going to reiterate it. You don't want more than $2,000 in your child's name anywhere. They can have a house and a car but no other than $2,000. Why? Because there are federal benefits, some state and local benefits as well, that are what we call means tested. Meaning we cannot get access to those things without coming into that financial requirement. Okay? Now there are ways to still allow your adult child to have money. That's what special needs trust enable accounts are for. But we have to do it in a specific way if we want them to have financial security. Anybody know what the old historical way to do this was when you, you were a parent before we had special needs trusts? You disowned it. You disinherited them. You gave the money to a sibling or a family member and hoped that that would work, right? What's the downside of that, do you think? They don't care as much. Maybe they don't care as much, but what happens if that person gets married and then divorced? What happens if they get in a car accident and get sued? There goes your kid's money. Not to their fault, necessarily. It wasn't on purpose but it becomes more at risk, okay? So especially stress is there to protect that, that adult child's money. Okay, a um, little bit about my practice. We're called whole story planning. We do things a little bit different than a lot of other advisors. Anybody have a financial planner or an, what I call an investment advisor in your life? They manage your retirement accounts? Anybody have an insurance agent? Yep. Anybody have somebody who's looking at all of it in one person? Okay. There's a big difference in what I do versus all of those. And a lot of that is because those two industries, insurance and investments, were separate for a really long time. They are now becoming much more holistic in terms of advice. And the reason for that is because I truly believe if you have a very good investment plan, you have the right amount and the right type of insurance, those two things can actually make each other more efficient. So if they're two separate people and they're not looking at everything together, I guarantee you, you probably have some gaps. And you might not even be being very tax efficient, all right? Maybe. So that's something. A, a financial planner that we're talking about here also is going to talk to you about your cash flow, your debt management, savings, investments, obviously, ABLE accounts. And then they're also going to be working with you to make sure the legal documents that you have in place with your, the attorney are matching to what you want, OK? The second team member, government benefits specialist. How many of you? have one of these. This is probably the biggest need in, in a team. Is that like a case worker? It can be a case manager. Not always. Not always. Case managers, in my experience, are overworked, underpaid, and usually leave pretty quick. So they're not experts, in my opinion. No offense if you are a case manager here. I love you. I hope you stay. You need to be paid more. OK? This is actually somebody, uh, a lot of times, who is educating us on the different types of benefits that are out there, how to maximize them, when to maximize them, because there's timing on some of these things. Yes, it can be a case manager. There's an organization I really like called National Care Advisors. I don't know if you guys have heard of them. You can write that down. 
we have some folks here in the metro region, um, Casey Visioneers, have you guys heard of Georgia Mueller? Those on the Missouri side, yeah, she's awesome, she does this. So if you need someone like this, let me know, whatever, come communicate with me and we'll talk about it. But really what we're wanting this person to, or this team to help us with is how do we maximize and when do we maximize these different state, local, and federal benefits. Also, if you move out of state, these change. These change. Um, an attorney, you're gonna hear from a, a, a couple of attorneys today. Will, power of attorney, power of healthcare. This, this is all wrapped in a big word that we call an estate plan. These are all the different documents included in an estate plan. Uh, guardianship is a big decision. We are starting to talk more and more about supported decision making with families, which is good, not quite the full guardianship process. And then of course, they're gonna help you write the special needs trust. We're gonna talk about a letter of intent. How many of you have heard of that? Or a memorandum of intent? Okay, we'll talk a little bit about that. I have a, an electronic copy that I think is actually really good. We've updated it and made it a lot more detailed and happy to send it to you guys as well. This is your legal piece. So what we like to see with families, of course, is also you're coming to the table with all these other resources, doctors, therapists, public and private programs, day programs maybe, sometimes churches or religious organizations will also provide some different supports. So we want the whole story. Do you like the name? That's why we did the whole story planning. Also, I wrote a book, so somebody thought that was funny. Okay, so we want the whole team together, and you get to design who these people are. You get to pick them. And if you don't want to work with me, great, you don't have to. But find somebody that fills that financial role, find somebody who fills the attorney role, and find somebody who can be your benefits expert, and then now we start developing this life plan in the village of supports that become maybe your replacement team. So that's the team. Next piece is the plan. How many of you have answered these questions? I'm so curious about this. Okay, we want to understand. So when we sit down with families, our first meeting is usually just getting to know you a little bit more. Just like when you meet a new doctor. You know, they do a full history. What's going on? What are you doing? Et cetera. So we're going to talk to you about what are your saving and spending habits? Do we have any debt we need to worry about? What resources are you uh, taking advantage of now in terms of the different benefits? And then what do you want for your future and your retirement? I had a dad start crying saying, why? Well, I, I don't think I'm gonna retire, I'm just gonna work till I die. I said, well, that's not really a plan. Because one of two things will happen. They're either gonna let you go because you're too old to work there or you'll become disabled and you can't anymore. Most people don't die at the desk. So what really is the plan, right? That response is just an avoidance answer, okay? Having a plan around this, you can do this. You absolutely can retire. You so I have families retiring early. Wouldn't that be nice? Okay, we have to understand where you are though because everything about you affects your child's future. So if you aren't financially secure, how are they gonna be? Okay, and then we start talking about your kiddo. What do they want for their future, right? The panel just before, they all had a design for their vision for their life. It's important to know that in the planning. If any of you use life course tools? No? Oh, pick, use the life course tools. They're amazing. This, they're really good at this part. So visioning what exactly it is we want for our child, or even you could do this for neurotypical children and have them participate. I think it's a great idea to start talking about post-secondary college or even tech school or whatever it is they want for their life. Why not? And then where will they live? Who's gonna provide the day-to-day -day care? And you can't say you. <laughs> can't say you, sorry. Who else? And then what social activities do you want them involved in? So I'll be really vulnerable here. My husband, when we started doing this planning, I mean, you saw my daughter. And ever since she was little, he's been her full-time caregiver because I carried the insurance and was the breadwinner. And so, you know, the roles became such. And so when we started talking about this for our kids, he said, well, she's gonna live at home with me all forever. Oh, so we're not, what do you mean? So we're not gonna retire or like go places, ever? He's like, well, I just don't want her anywhere because it'll be really dangerous and she's not safe. Or somebody could take advantage of her, Casey, because she's nonverbal. Okay, um, 
can we, we can jot the fears down. Let's, that's what we don't want for her. But as I've gone through this and worked with more and more families, learned about more and more community resources, community living options, I don't think Hudson wants to sit at home with her parents when she's 30. In fact, I think she'd be pretty upset and annoyed. She's very social. She loves, loves things like going to Taylor Swift concerts. Okay, I don't see her dad at 70 doing that. Um, she enjoys her friends at school. She loves going places and traveling. And so, you know, my point to him was, hey, maybe we start thinking about some creative solutions here. Can we have this village of support and sort of a transition team to full-time living for her somewhere else? Because the reality is he's 53 next month. She's only 13. Okay, <coughs> there's going to be a time where he's not gonna be able to do that direct caregiving anymore, probably during our lifetime. So how can we start easing into this conversation? So I say that to you guys because it's in my house. <laughs> we're having this debate and we're starting to, I'm slowly getting him there because we have to show examples of success, just like what you guys heard about earlier. You have to talk about those. We always hear about the horror stories. I wanna see the successful examples, because they exist too. All right, so once we figure out the plan, what's the vision? Now let's start looking at benefits. What are benefits gonna pay for? And what, what I mean by that is we're gonna look at Social Security, Medicaid, Voc Rehab, or any kind of employment supports. Public school services, certainly. We have the 18 to 21 programs across the metro, right? Life skills programs. And maybe if you have military service in the family, the VA can actually be very helpful too. Do you know they don't advertise that? <laughs> VA doesn't come out and say, hey, if you have a kiddo with a disability, come right over here. You sim simply fill out this one sheet of paper and, and we, will <laughs> we will take care of you. <laughs> So the VA has different, a variety of different programs for adults with disabilities if there was a family member that had military service, but you have to know where to ask and there's certain qualifications for that based on that service. So it exists, but see, you have to know to ask and where to go, right? So again, another reason why having some of these doorways, benefits expert to help you through this is really important. How many are on the IDD waiver wait list in Kansas? Yes. Is that just for parents in the military, or how far out does that extend, like grandparents? Um, usually direct parents. Usually direct parents. Um, yeah, most of the time. Wait list, anybody on the wait list in Kansas? Okay. Anybody on the IDD waiver now, actively? Okay, good. Um, the home and community-based supports, do you guys know the difference between that and traditional Medicaid? Somebody said no, okay. Traditional Medicaid is usually to qualify you have to be in poverty, or you have certain financial requirements. Home and community-based supports, which are typically the waiver or a waiver, gives you access to things like day services. Traditional Medicaid is usually just health insurance. So we want HCBS, we want that, because it gives us access to all these other things that, in, that help to build that replacement team. Does that make sense? Yes. The, the waivers are different, and in Missouri, if you have a minor child, you actually, you have to financially qualify for the waiver in Missouri, which I just learned about, and I don't think is cool. Um, so I need somebody over in Missouri to change that law. I think there's another one, another There's, there's a, the Lopez waiver, which is the medical complexity waiver. It's very hard to get that one, but, and I think they have 300 slots in the whole state. 350, is that right? It's really pretty impossible, and they look It's hard. But once you have an adult, once you're an adult then, you just get it. then you, you know, the home, or the hope waiver, the community waiver, the Lopez, you know, yeah. those all become. But Lopez ages off too. It's at 21, isn't it? Do you age yeah. off the Lopez? I think it does quit as soon as you get on your regular Medicaid, so 18. Okay. <laughs> so fun. They make it so simple. So the point is, even me, right, expert in this, in terms of working with families in all kinds of different states. Every state has different waiver programs. Every state has different qualifications for those waivers. Every waiver has a different thing that they will provide in terms of a list of supports. Nobody could just make it simple. <laughs> all states are different, including Kansas and Missouri. Oh, sorry, are we supposed to wait for questions? No. Okay. Um, so is there uh, like a federal government that would tell you about different states? So if you're yeah. 
Great question. So is there a federal benefits expert? That's usually when I'll go to National Care Advisors. Okay. They ser they're based in Ohio, but they serve families in all 50 states. So if I have a question, hey, I've got a military family who's being forced to move, and they have these two choices in terms of where they're going to live, which one is better for their family? I wish I could meet families before that move ever happened, but unfortunately that it's usually the opposite. They usually are forced and then we have to figure out benefits later. You go into retirement, you want to retire somewhere else. It's possible, you're not stuck here, but it does require some planning. Okay, I think the, mo the biggest benefit system that we probably get questions around is Social Security. Anybody understand Social Security really well? Anybody a Social Security expert in here? <laughs> Y'all, I've been doing this for a long time and I'm still learning stuff. Do you know the POMS, the actual manual for Social Security officers, do you know how, you know how many pages are in that thing? 56,000 <laughs> pages, single spaced with code. You know, like it's like, it's like reads like the IRS code. So for a really long time, there were a lot of Social Security <coughs> officers who didn't even know about ABLE accounts, even though it was in their palms. So oftentimes they say, no, that's countable. And we're just battling with family saying, no, but it's on page 46,325, code three, you know, and they're like, oh yeah, here it is. You're right. Okay. So it's a very large, complicated system. And oftentimes it's changing. We're seeing some changes. So here are the basics. How many have heard of Supplemental Security Income, SSI? Okay, if you have a child under the age of 18, in order to qualify them for SSI, and they can qualify with their disability, the parent's income, assets, and household size is the formula that Social Security uses for that family or that child to qualify for SSI. Roughly 46, 47,000 for a family of four gross income or under. It scales based on how many kids, yes? Are you guys some case managers, like social work? What do you guys do? No. We're just parents. Oh, you're just parents. We oh. just have recently done this process. I love it. Our kids are getting ready to turn well within a year. Or two. Okay, so you're so about ready for adult training. Yeah, you started this whole thing. Okay, good. So this will be a review then. Um, the eligibility and benefit amount are also determined by that. Okay, so that's under age 18. Right now, Hudson 13, Domic 11, I could apply for them to get SSI, but we make too much money. We have too many assets, so they won't qualify. However, once your child turns 18, has that same qualifying disability, now it's their income and assets that counts, not the parents. So it changes, okay? so. They look at, does the child have less than $2,000, a house and a car? Okay. Are they earning income? Here's a big one. Anybody have a blended family or divorce situation? Child support counts against this. Did you know that? Most families don't. Most divorce attorneys don't, which I hate. <laughs> um, question. What about the survival benefits? Survivor benefits different. Totally different than this. Again, 56,000 pages. Okay, <laughs> this is one program with Social Security. There's like three or four. So at 18, in 2024, the maximum amount for SSI is $943 a month. If your child is earning $900 a month or more, I think this might be closer to 1,000 now, gross income, they won't qualify for that. How much? $900 a month or more. If they make that, they won't qualify for any? Probably not. Yes, if, no. so, if they are a student, they can get a little Yes, but again, earned income is still going to reduce that amount. Child support ends at age 18. Sometimes. Sometimes not with divorced families who have a, a child with a disability. But yeah, that's good. Yeah. The other option to that, by the way, is to require the other parent to contribute to an ABLE account. Yes. My son works in the SSI. He makes $1,050 a month. How much is he getting in SSI? $331. Okay. Is he living on his own? Um, they're viewing him as living on his own. Okay. He's that's why. Household, but okay. That's why. Sorry. Yeah, Referencing living with family. Thank you. Yeah. I guess that's where I struggle, and I don't know if you can touch on this, is like at what point do you limit your child? from having some success in the workplace so that they like exactly. she turned 18 two weeks ago and i'm just like 
attend this thing. Well, let me, let me offer this. Do we have to have SSI to be successful? No. Yeah, if they're making more than $1,000 a month, great, go make it. It's just like, they turn 18, this is what you need to do. Yeah. And I, I'm just like, really, do we? You don't have to. I have a lot of families that don't get SSI or maybe don't want it. It's, it's not a requirement. I will say though, that applying for Kansas, like Medicaid and HCBS and all that, they want to see that you are SSI qualified. Okay, so, so, really the so it's actually either or. Yeah. Social Security is a gateway to Medicaid, Medicaid is a gateway to Social Security. You get approved for one, the other one is like, yeah, you're accepted. It's an easier doorway. <laughs> yes, that is true. That is so very true. We already have the IDD waiver. Going into Social Security is going to be easier. More simple. Okay. I don't know about easier. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing about Social Security is easy. Okay. Oh. Yes, yes ma'am. Well, the disadvantage, okay. too, is what if they lose their income all of a sudden? Correct. Correct. That's right. That's a very good point. Did you guys hear that? If they lose their job or change jobs or something happens with their job, it is actually good to still be qualified because then you can get back in the system more quickly. It's better to apply so that you qualify except for your income amount. Yes. So you don't get any money right now, but you still qualify. Mm -hmm. you know, it's better to just apply and say you do qualify even if you're not going to get it, like, totally. money out of it. Love it, yeah. So I don't want them to be limited. Yeah. Not saying that. But if this is a situation, for example, like my daughter, we, she needs this. Yeah. This is something that's important. Now, it's going to get more fun. Here's the second program to Social Security. This is not SSI, this is called SSDI. So the first was Supplemental Security Income, this is Social Security Disability Income. Often people confuse these two, often. In fact, I hear, oh yeah, she gets disability. Well, actually she's getting SSI. And the way you can tell is usually by the amount, all right? So I'm gonna talk through this. When a parent or a guardian retires and takes Social Security for themselves, and the adult child has been approved, maybe doesn't receive, but has been approved for SSI, the child now can take advantage of what's called a DAC benefit, Disabled Adult Child, DAC. That's their acronym. There's so many acronyms. DAC, Disab Disabled Adult Child. What does that mean? Parents' retirement check stays the same no matter what when the DAC is elected. It doesn't affect the parent's retirement check, which is good. All of a sudden now, the adult child with a disability gets a 50% bump up, or excuse me, gets a 50% check of usually the parent's retirement check, usually. So it's higher typically, instead of SSI, it turns into SSDI, instead of. So if you are maximizing SSI, let's just say, um, Let's say I retire and my retirement, my Social Security retirement is $3,000 a month, okay? And Hudson was getting 943 on SSI. As Soon as I elect, I say, hey, Social Security officer, oh yeah, you have to tell them this too. They aren't gonna just automatically do it. <laughs> so it's, you gotta go back into the system. Hey, I, have, I wanna elect a DAC benefit for my adult daughter who was disabled at birth. Okay, great, let me pull up her record. They look it up. Now she's gonna get roughly $1,500 a month instead of the 943. And guess what happens? This is very important. The DAC benefit or SSDI is not a means-tested benefit. So they can work all they want and still get it. It's very important, okay? So if you have, likewise, if you have an adult parent who's on disability, the child would qualify for SSDI. Okay, that lasts with them the rest of their life. So when you elect Social Security matters. If your investment person or insurance person or whoever you call a financial planner isn't talking about this, your retirement plan is wrong. It's wrong. Even after we die, that's... Continues. Till the kid is there. Sorry? Till the kid is alive, right? Yeah, it lasts the rest of their life. It's like so a pension for them. Uh, if suppose you said three thousand, so the kid may get up to fifteen hundred dollars, kind of, right? If yours is around eighteen hundred dollars, the kid is gonna get nine hundred, but that nine hundred is safe for his income level, right? That's right. So that is more advisable than SSI. Then. We want SSDI over SSI. Yeah. We right. want SSDI. No asset limit. Why? Because it's on a work record. The parents contributed Social Security for this benefit. And that would, if you have two kids that are disabled, that would be for each one of them. Well, 
There's an exception. Uh, wah, wah. Now you're starting to get into something called a family maximum. Anybody heard of that? On your social security record, how many of you know how to go find your social security record now? Because they don't mail them anymore. The government saves like $20 million by not mailing them. <coughs> so now what do they make you do? You go online. You go online. SSA.gov. You, you like tell them your blood type and third born child and all of that. And then you get an account, right? So it's highly secure. On that SSA.gov record, you can download or look at your current social security statement, okay? I, I look at thousands of these every year. That first page, you know the bar graph that says, hey, if you elect at 62, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way down to 72, you know, the, mm -hmm. on the right? And then on the left, it'll tell you your full retirement age, your FRA. So depending on the year you were born, that changes. Mine is 67. Well, I, some people I wear at 65, sometimes it's 66, sometimes it's 66 and a third mm -hmm. or three quarters. It's right there on the left, that's important. Because guess what, SSDI is maxed at your FRA amount. So my child maxes at 67 when I turn 67, full retirement age. That means Social Security says, if you want to go back to work after full retirement age, we're not going to take away your Social Security benefit, retirement benefits. You can keep getting Social Security retirement, and you can go work and make 100 grand a year. We don't care. Oh, no, wait, say that again. At FRA, full retirement age, you can work part-time or full-time, and they're not going to make you pay back benefits. If you elect early and then go work, you can only work a certain amount, or they'll make you pay back. But for your kid, it, it doesn't, it's not beneficial for you to wait longer. It depends. Financial analysis around that's really important. It depends. Okay, so I want to go back to this gentleman's thing. The bottom of that page, that first page, bottom left, it'll have a list of numbers. And the very bottom one is called a family household maximum. I want you to know what that number is. Let's just say, for most families, it's five to 6,000. Let's say it's $5,000, okay? So let's go back to that original example. $3,000, my full retirement age benefit. Hudson gets $1,500. That's $4,500. You do that again with another kid, we're hitting family maximum. Now your spouse will not be able to elect on that record. Does that make sense? Did you hear that? We have two parents working. A lot of times, maybe a parent is not working. They're going to elect on the spouse's record for retirement. They may not get a benefit if we're maxing out DAC. Also really important to do the financial analysis. Doesn't matter if your child lives with you or not. Mm. Is this why sometimes um, spouses legally divorce? <coughs> <laughs> well, because I've heard of a lot of families that because of social security issues, they've done gone through a legal divorce even though. So that also depends because if I was thinking because if they were married for 10 years, actually it wouldn't matter. Oh, okay. Because they're still going to count them as a whole record. <laughs> and we do have to move on from this because <laughs> I love you guys. For SSDI, for SSDI, does it take the first person that retires or the, the mm -hmm. larger amount? Does it take the first person that retires or the larger amount? What do you guys think? <laughs> when you elect DAC, it's a permanent election. So if you elect it on the low. That's fine. Do that. Okay. And wait for my husband. Higher record. Okay. Always wait for the higher record okay. for DAC. So you can't do one child under one parent? Nope. It's not a spousal benefit. It's okay. not the same. When you elect DAC, it's permanent. I mean, like, say, I retire and I elect my first child with disabilities. My husband retires, he elects the other child with disabilities. Can't do that. Can't do that. It's a family it's a family decision. If you have a space where you have more than one DAC and a spouse, can you? elect the amount of the benefit to, or is it? Are you saying, can I pick which record the DAC goes on? No. Like, if the maximum is 6,000, and Hudson's going to have 15, and you're at 3,000, and that's 45, and you have to come back. Um, can you scale Hudson's? Nope. She maxes out at that 50%, no matter what. So even if you have more than, if you have two or more DACs, and a spouse, you can't, you can't set. No, sorry. Okay. No, that would be super flexible though. <laughs> I would actually like that. Can I pick and choose Social Security who I give the money to? They're like, no. One third, one third. 
Yeah, I know. I wish. I wish. Okay, does this? Yes. What happens to the the DAC child when the parent dies that you elected? What happens to the DAC benefit? Like, Nothing. They still get the benefit. Uh -huh. till they the continue to get the benefit for their whole life, mm -hmm. even if the parents. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a parent that dies before the DAC has been elected, which happens, yeah. then that's survivor benefits. Okay. That's the fourth program. Mm -hmm. So fun. And that's generally 75% of whatever the full retirement age was going to be. And they get that for life. The survivor benefits, if it's a minor child, they stop at age 18. So then what do they do? How do they elect? SSI and SSDI after that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hey, guess what else? After 24 months on the DAC, your child qualifies for Medicare. Medicare? Medicare. Versus Medicaid, then they lose Medicaid. No. Medicare becomes primary, Medicaid becomes secondary. We want both. 24 months of being on SSDI. Yeah. Okay. This, you guys, all these questions, all these variables, all of you have totally different situations, even though you share a diagnosis with your kids, okay, is why you need a plan. Mm -hmm. And you need to know specifically for your own family, when do I elect, when does this happen, how does this work? Because I'm going to guess you guys know what your rent or mortgage payment is, don't you? Mm -hmm. You know where your income is coming from and the amount of your paycheck and when it hits your bank account, no? Mm -hmm. Why are we not then developing this, right? So this piece here, this right here, when we're maximizing benefits, when we have the vision for the life plan, we have started to identify the replacement team, the village of support for our child, we now can actually start building a financial plan for them. So when I talk to families, I have a special needs trust, great, how much is going into it? Well, you know, my estate when I die. That's it? That's the extent of the planning? No. Hey, when are you going to retire? Probably, probably at 65. Do you have enough money? I don't know. I mean, that's, that's the same answer. If you're not doing retirement planning and you're not going to do financial planning for your child, then how do you know that either is going to be secure? When we do, this whole industry, you guys, financial planning is a whole industry. And 90% of it talks about just retirement planning for people. Which is great. We all need that help. We need that support. How many years do you think do people save for retirement? How many? Yes, forever. 40, 50, 60 years. I mean, it's a long time. But we're just saying, hey, we're going to create a document, hire an attorney, and go, well, whatever goes in there goes in there for our kid. Really? This is where, in my opinion, both the financial services industry and, not criticizing, but some of the legal industry fails. We got to know. We got to reverse engineer this a little bit. So where I live in most of my professional job every day is figuring out where do you want your child to live, what's the care that they're being provided, who's providing it, what benefits are out there that we can maximize, and then what's the net cost to supporting that lifestyle, if there is one. Because if you don't know that net, how are we going to reverse engineer how much needs to go into the special needs trust at any given time? Right? Does that make sense? Same idea, it's just your child's retirement. I didn't know that though. I guess that's where I struggle. I don't know where I want her to live. She's 18, and I still fair. don't know what she's going to be capable of. That's fair. Not a lot of people know exactly how much they need in retirement either. But we get close. So do you just figure, like, worst case scenario, this is the most? Yeah. For that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Best case scenario, this is what I'd really want. Life course tools. What I really want, what I don't want. Okay? Third-party trusts, you're going to hear a lot about these later. Basically, we put money or assets into these. They don't count against access to benefits. Anybody know what a special needs trust can't pay for? What? Okay. Oh, no, that's ABLE. That's ABLE accounts. <laughs> we'll get there. Special needs trust can't usually supplant what government benefits are providing. So, for example, if your child's getting SSI, we can't. 
Okay, a couple more minutes. Oh, we have gosh. lots of questions. I'm sorry. Worried. Okay. We'll, have, we'll do a follow up. Rent, utilities, and food. Yeah, if your child's getting SSI, we can't pay for rent, utilities, and food from a special needs trust. It supplants the benefits. It negates why it exists. So that's why we use an ABLE account. You guys need an attorney that helps you develop the special needs trust. Lots of attorneys um, will say they can do special needs planning. In my opinion, there's a handful here in Kansas City that are really good at it. Interview multiple people. Get pricing. Talk to them. We also believe in naming a corporate trustee in your estate plan versus a family member that controls the money. Why? Because it's a really big job. But I also want to check and balance on the corporate trustee. They are not the attorney that writes the trust. Uh-uh, that's a big no-no, conflict of interest. They, you want the trust written, and then you get to select who that corporate trustee is. And you need to check and balance on that system. Maybe it's a family member that's a co-trustee. Okay? Letter of intent, we'll pass this out to you guys. This is your last set of instructions for caregiving for your child. You die tomorrow, you die in 40 years. This should be filled out. It goes with the plan. ABLE accounts. Medicaid doesn't count a dime in these. If you get SSI, they need to be under $100,000. You're going to learn more about these from Sarah today. I like them because they're really good for education. They're great to supplement housing. We can pay for rent, utilities, and food from an ABLE account. We can put earned income in ABLE accounts on top of the 18,000 limit. So if your child is working and employed, we can put money in here from their employment checks. It's an incentive for them to save. It's great. They can spend it on whatever, just nothing illegal. Sins, the five sins. No ATM cash, no gambling. Alcohol, I've been told by Tom and some ABLE people, is kind of allowed if they're age 21. OK. If you guys want more information, fill out the form. I'm going to pull this together right there. I'm done.